Good morning, everyone, and good evening to our friends in Europe and the rest of the world. Welcome to today's webinar, hosted by Civil Maps. Today's topic is a scalable approach to point cloud data processing. I'm your host, Shrevan Pitagunta, the CEO of Solfest Research. Today, we will conduct a comparative analysis of different techniques, approaches to point cloud processing. We will introduce you to our product, Civil Maps, and our workflow for annotating point cloud data sets. We hope that you'll appreciate the simplicity and reduction in time complexity of our workflow. At the end of the webinar, we'll have a Q&A session on Google Hangouts if you have more questions. I would also like to thank our partners and customers that have worked with us on refining our product and improving our user experience. Now let's get started. In our last webinar, we exposed some of the issues with point cloud data processing and went through several examples as well as different industry use cases. For the sake of simplicity, today we'll focus on one of our previous use cases. Last year, Solfus processed 1,200 kilometers of date rail data to capture center lines, electrical wires, and poles. The input data consisted of a series of Cartesian coordinates sequentially listed in an ASCII file, and the output data was annotated as layers representing each feature. Here's a quick demo of our results. Most of these approaches today involve the use of a software tool to analyze point cloud data sets. These software tools have interfaces which require the user to firstly load the data into memory from disk. As you can see in the chart below, the memory that is available on an average machine ranges from 4 gigabytes to 8 gigabytes. Therefore, the limiting bottleneck is how much data an application can load into memory at any given time. Assuming that the point cloud has a fairly high point density, the size of the data set being analyzed at one time might be limited to a couple kilometers. In a big data set, the 1200 kilometer data that we used would need to be segmented into different segments and chunks and processed sequentially if you were to use these software tools. Assuming every 100 megabytes of data from disk translates into one gigabyte of data in memory uh, when you use it for visualization, we can roughly load 400 megabytes of data um, into memory before saturating that machine. Even still, the application being that's loading the data into memory can only visualize the data. We haven't even gotten to the processing component yet. The user's interface to navigate the point cloud data um, involves like tools to change perspectives, uh, allows them to zoom in and out and traverse that data but that would consume most of the CPU cycles while they're using that tool. This often leads to a poor user experience since the main bottleneck is the visualization component and none of the resources are being used towards processing the data for generating these reports. Now, Let's take a step back. What if we didn't need to visualize the data in order to process it? This is the paradigm shift in our approach to the problem. What if we completely changed the method in how we analyze, annotate, and create reports from a point cloud data set? How is this achievable? How do I know it works? What accuracy would a solution that is not dependent on visualization produce? What are the benefits of such a does it even make sense? The, the question to ask here is, how can we go from Cartesian coordinates or a point cloud to features? The answer is algorithms. Essentially, we need to teach computers to recognize patterns that humans visually identify 
when looking at rendered point clouds. These algorithms include clustering, projections, linear transforms, and as well as nonlinear methods. On top of analyzing geometry, we also use machine vision techniques and frequency domain analysis. But these methods can only take you so far. To overcome these issues and more, we at Civil Maps use the concept of machine learning to make predictions on point cloud data. This is the same type of technology that Google uses to predict what website a user wants to see based on their search. At a basic level, we operate by forming models of various assets requested by the user, and then we train our algorithms to identify features that look similar enough to the model. In a sense, we are making predictions or decisions as the point cloud is traversed rather than just strictly relying on the geometry and basic transformations. Let's look at an analogy to help you understand. In the English language, what is the most common letter that comes after the letter Q? The answer is obviously the letter U. Think of queen, quiche, quick, quench, quasi, etc. In the English language, there is a high probability that the letter U will follow the letter Q. If a machine learning model was trained against the English language, that model will predict the letter U to be after every letter Q. What happens when that problem statement is changed? For example, can you tell me what letter comes after Q if the language that we're running our model on is Russian? The answer isn't U. In the Russian language, the English prediction model breaks. So similarly, in LiDAR data, when perspectives change, when point density changes, when accuracy changes, or when the industry is different, a one-size-fits-all software solution will not work. This is precisely why off-the-shelf software tools containing algorithms can never deliver the required accuracy to move towards automation. Machine learning algorithms are not guaranteed to produce the best results. Different algorithms will work better on different data sets. This can be related to the quality of the 3D scan data, the area captured, etc. In order to pick the best algorithm for each new data set, here at Simul Maps, we, are, we use an emerging computer science concept called deep learning. Deep learning basically allows Civil Maps to choose the best algorithm from all of our algorithms to produce the best results for each data set. When a customer uploads a data set, we require our customers to upload a small segment of manually labeled point cloud data. We use this to compare the results of our different algorithms with the manually labeled data set, and then we choose the best algorithm with the most accurate results. The manually labeled data set is useful for measuring the difference between the manual annotation and our algorithms. When we have, what we have found is that oftentimes the algorithm performs better than the manually labeled data set. In this picture, you can see the comparison in the difference of the rail centerline heights. Our algorithms generate results um, as shown in the blue line. The manually annotated lines are shown as the red lines. The red lines contain artifacts that result from using point and click methods uh, when a user is drawing line segments. The red lines therefore look bumpy with jumps. In comparison, the civil maps algorithms have generated a smooth output represented by the blue line. This is one example of how a deep learning algorithm can outperform manual annotation in terms of accuracy and precision. Since humans are much better at recognizing patterns than computers, a single algorithm will not be able to replicate complex manual annotation work. However, advancements in deep learning have now created opportunities to choose different algorithms based on the data to start to recognize patterns similar to humans. This model is similar to how we utilize our brains. We use combinations of actions to perform different tasks. For example, 
A baby performs different maneuvers when it learns to walk. These include balancing by holding their arms out, wobbling between different legs, etc. They immediately learn that there is always a better way to walk. Making slight changes, babies try different combinations of actions. It, they usually remember what worked well, and they try to improve upon it. Since they've also seen their parents walk, they have a reference of what is considered ideal. With every new attempt, they use both their reference of walking and their memory of their previous attempts to improve. In our process, the parents walking is like the manually annotated data set. It gives our system a gold standard to compare our results with. Similarly, we can try different algorithms and measure what works best to continually improve our results. Instead of trying a new way to walk only a few times a day, our system tries thousands of combinations of algorithms per day. Civil Maps uses deep learning to contextualize project requirements into a format that machines understand. It then leverages statistic model, statistical models to start creating reports. Essentially, it's an artificial intelligence search engine for point cloud data. The first requirement in such a system is feedback. The feedback, the feedback in the case of civil maps is the manual annotation of assets in a small segment of data being compared to the output generated by the algorithms. Using this, civil maps tries various combinations of algorithms and settings to try and achieve the desired output. Initially, it is not as good as humans. However, it will keep trying combinations for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After a couple hundred iterations, it starts generating algorithms that start to become more efficient than human annotation. In other words, the system gets better after each passing day. In a deep learning model, a reward is given for accuracy and efficiency and turnaround time. And every time a combination of algorithms achieves results that are closer to a manually labeled data set, they score higher. By leveraging the scoring system, civil maps algorithms self-tune themselves to achieve the best results. In other words, as we collect more data and create more reports, our algorithms are contributing towards building the best point cloud labeling algorithms that are available on the market. In summary, the more data we have, the more users we have, and the more uh, uploads we have, the better our report accuracy becomes. So when you use civil maps, you're benefiting from the cumulative knowledge of algorithm tuning from all of the previous reports that were generated. So how can you take part today in what we're working on? Well, in the second quarter of 2015, we are launching a beta release of civil maps. And as a thank you for attending this webinar, we're actually giving out $2,000 of credit for any project that has greater than $10,000 worth of work. And if you want more information regarding this offer, you can just email us at info at solfus.com for details. Anyways, with this beta release, you'll be able to upload your data to our servers Provide us with a training set consisting of annotated ground truth, point, um, ground truth point cloud data and also describe the desired report. And once that process is complete, um, this will trigger our algorithms to annotate the remainder of your data set. We will then iterate with our users over the report specification until um, you're satisfied. We currently have a queue of about 10 data sets to process, and we expect this to increase to 50 in the next month. For the initial release, we'll focus on the top three opportunities based on um, the amount of data we need to process and the type of assets we need to annotate. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, well, thank you very much for attending our webinar. Hopefully it was uh, helpful. Um, and so we're going to open it up now for Q&A, so join us on Google Hangouts.
operated by Brother Morris and various prophets, requested by the Miami Clinic on August 10th, that we try to do a public funeral event. In a sense, we are making suggestions for the big event at the Sunnyside Hospital, that is the Hospital for Sick Children and Young Families in Miami City on the 8th of May. Let's take an analogy to help you understand. Let me move to Hong Kong. What is the most common letter that Hong Kong carry around with you? The hand stamp is obviously the letter U. Think of U, V, six, nine, bottom, six. In the U, there is the highest value of U, a letter U called the K. It's a streamlined letter with plain print on the inside that's not a circular. The letter U is meant for every letter in the U. 